Marrying AI to the Blockchain Vince Vella, University of Malta Sally Eves, Fintech Blockchain AI Joseph Duro, SNPs Mark Müller-Eberstein, Agitech Corporation Moderated by Angelo Dalli, AI Entrepreneur Good morning. It's been a really exciting day, as we know, as Honorable Silvio Scambri has mentioned. Yesterday, Malta has launched the AI strategy, um, which I think is very exciting. I'm part of the committee also that will make sure that Malta has world-class AI legislation. And it's an interesting panel because AI is a black box and quite centralized, while blockchain is transparent and decentralized. So I think we're going to have contrasting words and the marriage of them. We have a very interesting panel here. I'm just going to go through the introductions very, very quickly. Uh, Vince is the CTO of Computime, BRS Analytics and City Labs, has over 20 years of experience. Um, uh, and is also responsible for the master's course here in the FinTech at the University of Malta. Sally Eves is the CEO of the Sustainable Asset Exchange, and she's a member of the Forbes Technology Council, and also the social impact lead for the UK Blockchain Association, and works closely with the United Nations on sustainable development goals. Joseph Duro is the CTO of SNPs and co-founder of St Standard Analytics, a platform that uses edge computing to connect uh, scientific knowledge, and has previously worked at NASA and the Melinda Bill Gates Foundation. And Mark Miller Eberstein is the CEO and founder of Ad Agitech Corporation and is a well known investor in blockchain and uh, also a member of the Washington State State IoT Council. So I'll start with uh, Joseph. Um, AI requires massive amounts of computation and data. I mean, Andrew Ng, who is one of the leaders in uh, deep learning, has said that the, the availability of data is one of the drivers that has led to the advances of AI. I, um, blockchain seems to neither have the central data store nor the fast computation. Um, how do you do machine learning without a centralized data store and harvesting of user data? Okay, so yeah, it's true that uh, to do machine learning you need data and you need computing power. Uh, and the idea is not to replace all of it with the blockchain. Is the idea would be to use blockchain to solve the problems that the needs we have. Um, so I'm going to take an example. So everything we do in my company is uh, voice interfaces. So we do a private voice interface alternative to Alexa. And to do this, uh, basically to train our models, we've been able to reproduce the performances of Google Speech and Alexa by using data sets that we buy and crowdsourcing. Um, so basically data sets that you buy off the shelf, you don't really need to solve that with the blockchain. I think that, that, that's a, that exists, there are solutions, so that's fine. Crowdsource is actually something that's a very interesting problem to tackle through the blockchain because today the main platform to run crowdsourcing is Amazon Mechanical Turks. So you have hundreds of thousands of people, of workers, who are working for that platform, completely dependent of what Amazon depends, completely dependent of the margin that Amazon decides to do on that. Uh, and on the other hand, you have a lot of companies like us that rely on crowdsourcing and uh, that are also dependent on Amazon. So here you have like a very centralized system that is just an open door for the blockchain to, uh, to modify and to revolutionize. And Vince, Vince, your interest uh, rotated around computational finance. Um, how do you see this issue of user data and also how do you see the overlap between the AI and blockchain words in managed finance? So, I mean... The way I see it, I mean, um, firstly, I mean, machine learning and AI has been applied in finance and computational finance for quite some years now. But uh, with, uh, with blockchain coming on board, um, we're seeing how blockchain and the characteristics of blockchain are affecting AI and how that, in turn, is affecting the application of AI in finance. So we spoke about decentralization. I mean, decentralization, in, when it comes to AI, let's, let's keep it, let's say, simple. When it comes to building models, the traditional way when you're building model, you're, you're, you're collecting data, centralizing it, and building a central model. So it's quite different from, from a decentralized environment. When it comes to, for example, um, transparency, I mean, in blockchain, sort of transparency is a key characteristic. When it comes to AI, it's quite a black box. So, so we have inputs, we have a set of mathematical models in the middle, 
and then output, we can see the relationship, but it's not that easy to, to see what's really happening in the middle. And openness. Um, you have the blockchain environment, which is, let's say, quite one of the characteristics is that mm -hmm. it's quite open. Mm -hmm. You can see the source code, you can see smart contract code, mm -hmm. so it's pretty much open for everyone. When it comes to AI, um, anyone who has built quite interesting mm -hmm. models, I doubt it whether they will actually share um, their models. So how is this affecting um, finance, like for example in situations where AI is being used in, 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 in managing funds, for example. Mm -hmm. So obviously what we're seeing is that rather than looking at possibly AI just being a centralized model, we're seeing initiatives like for example, in, even in AI research, not just in practice, where for example, we're seeing things like federated learning, or we're seeing like the popular numeri, where you have an AI fund, which is being sort of, you know, we have a number of machine learning <coughs> contributors, and automatically the blockchain is getting all the results or predictions, and somehow the ecosystem is as well um, giving back rewards to the modelers who are actually contributing to the fund. Um, when it comes to openness and transparency, I mean, anyone who worked in finance in machine learning, you can appreciate that it's sometimes very important that you don't, you don't just look at the signal being provided by the model, but sort of you would be really helpful if you can understand why the model is giving that signal. So there are research efforts, like for example, explainable AI, which is helping to make AI models more explainable, and that will help a lot that rather than just getting signals before pumping millions of money um, in your investments, you can actually get a better understanding of why the models are giving those signals. So this is quite active research which is actually happening in this field. Very interesting. Mark, I'd like to get your perspectives as an investor. Um, how many blockchain projects have you invested in and how many of those have been AI? <laughs> so uh, we have significant investments in about a uh, little bit over a dozen of uh, blockchain projects um, globally. So we helped the folks from Disney leaving Disney and founding Dragon Chain. We helped uh, the in Southeast Asia changing payment system with Pondix. And uh, but before I go into the so I, I love blockchain. I love AI and I would love to see them two to get, uh, coming together. And no, we have not found a project right now that combines blockchain and AI. We see a lot of pict pitches that see blockchain, AI, autonomous driving, IoT, all of them ideally together, trying to raise a lot of money, but none of them really are working at this point, uh, I think, in a way that an investor could recoup their investments in a significant way. I see. Sally, I mean, one of my interests persons, this is the application of ethical AI, AI that impacts society positively. Um, I know that you've set up aspirational futures to deal specifically with this and other technology. Um, how do you see blockchain impacting AI and society positively? Yeah, aspirational futures is all about the purpose of technology. And when we're looking at advanced technology such as blockchain and AI, sometimes this human side of tech gets a little bit left behind and underexplored. So with aspirational futures, it's been supported by SACS um, as part of a real ecosphere for business development, also social impact at scale. We're developing the talent here. We're looking at inclusion and diversity. So who's building the AI? We need a real inclusion and diversity of perspectives to actually embed that into development. Um, also, we're looking at aspects like opening up opportunity. So we have hubs for aspirational futures around the world, including developing areas which are sometimes left behind. So it's all about social impact at scale, looking at these projects, supporting development, and also having cross-sectoral voices. So as well as fantastic events like this, a blockchain and crypto community a little bit more specific, this panel's great because we've got a range of perspectives here from academia, practice um, and business and I think we need more of that we need cross-sector conversations and also really good quality mm. information that's going mm. to the more what mainstream public mm. so that everybody can get involved in these conversations excellent and uh, Joseph data privacy is obviously something that links to the social impact I mean how do you see that in your opinion can you make crypto run in a more private environment that protects the rights of the individual to privacy while balancing the needs of AI to have access to the data and learn from it so we mentioned the need of data to train good machine learning models. I mentioned crowdsourcing, but actually the real thing that you need to have the best performances is raw user data, because that's where you're going to apply your model. Uh, but then you have a price problem. So federated learning was mentioned. So I don't know if anyone is familiar with this. 
Basically, it's a new type of machine learning where instead of centralizing the data on the server to train the model, basically the data stay with, stays where it is, so on people's devices, and you send the models to the data. Each model is going to learn locally, and then you aggregate the models together in a way that has learned from anyone but hasn't needed to centralize the data at any time. So doing that with the blockchain is probably a good idea because you want to incentivize people to give you access to their data. But what you need to do on top of that when you aggregate the models, there's still information about what they've been learning locally. So you want to aggregate these models in a private way. So that's where cryptography comes into play. Uh, and what people are looking at is multi-party computation. So a way to aggregate and to mix these models that have learned locally in a way that doesn't uh, leak the information of that they've, what they've been learning on each device. So federated learning, mixing with multi-party computation is probably something that we're going to be hearing about more and more. So you may all hate me for the statement that I'm about to make, but I believe that the blockchain infrastructure at the moment is too slow for large-scale AI applications. Um, so Vince here has done a lot of research on smart contracts. I mean, how do you see that smart contracts that can run at scale rather than just having a few thousand transactions and crash? How can they actually run in the future? Can we do this? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of research happening in that field, and, uh, and sort of, you know, it's, it's obviously something which is required, I think, if, if we really want uh, to see the sort of smart contracts applied throughout. Um, however, sort of, I will try to obviously try to overlap a bit with AI. So, so, so since obviously the topic here is, is, is on AI, and uh, I wish to mention maybe certain aspects where, where AI can help. So, when it comes to speed, for example, we're seeing a lot of issues. Like, for example, areas which are being investigated is the idea of sharding, for example. Mm. So, okay, I mean maybe AI can help. So, so when we look, when we think about AI at the end of the day, is basically we have a set of mathematical functions which, at the end of the day, give us an output which help us infer certain outcomes and those help us take certain decisions. But by doing so, we're taking a probabilistic approach rather than deterministic, which is mo more probably the case in the blockchain world. But that probabilistic approach typically helps us to speed up matters in the sense rather than maybe going through heavy processing and sort of through all the data, etc., etc., that helps us to make efficient decisions. So linking back with performance, the idea is normally where AI fits is where you look at processes, now being it the blockchain as a system or any business process or whatever, and you identify certain inefficiencies, mm -hmm. that is where AI can help. So if, for example, we're saying that there is scalability issues or certain performance issues, maybe with the proof of work um, algorithm, maybe with scalability, sharding, etc., etc., all these for me are like possible improvement points where something like AI can, can actually help. And this, this is the way I see it. Mark, do you see that the investment then should focus more on the basic research to actually create infrastructure that can handle AI in blockchain? I think uh, there's a lot of groundwork that still needs to be done. I think the argument you said earlier, so it sounds like in the early 90s when it took like all these internet things too slow because it took like uh, a picture when you downloaded it, it was built up like line by line and now we do 4K video streaming at home. It's just a question of time until the performance is there. But yes, you're right. We need to make investments in the infrastructure and that's, that doesn't happen in two months. I mean, if you look at uh, Makeout, for example, they worked for four years to create an infrastructure, to create a potential new financial system. I think if we're looking at AI, the same thing. We need to understand that from an academic perspective what's necessary, what's required, but also you have the key AI players. I mean, there's, it's really hard to compete with companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft that have huge amount of data for their engines to learn it. Um, face recognition. I mean, there's one or two companies that have basically cornered the market outside of China, that's because they have so much data, the machines can learn so quickly. Um, so it's really a complete industry, I think, approach that needs to happen. And um, academic can play a key role there as well. And yes, please, if you have great ideas, send them my way. <laughs> what do you see as the investment opportunities, actually, in between the overlap between blockchain and AI? <sighs> As I said, we're looking at a lot of pictures. We haven't made an investment in that space, but I think I'm looking at community approaches. I mean, what, 
Ethereum is not, it was not originally an investment opportunity. It was figuring out how you can create a smart contract environment. So people that are passionate about fixing a problem. So we are looking for people that are in organizations that saying, okay, the AI is a huge opportunity. And I think communication and transactions between AIs, for example, need to be solved. And it could be solved with an independent blockchain. So who is building that? Who is bringing these pieces together? And um, yes, then there are investment opportunities coming out of that. But it's the underlying things that need to be solved first. So, and Sally, do you think that users uh, should be compensated for their data on the blockchain? Would this be a very good use of blockchain? And also, what do you see are the implications beyond just the business considerations? Uh, yes, yeah, short answer is absolutely yes. Um, I mean, we, we, at the moment, we're in a period of a 17-year period of lack of trust. And that goes beyond business. It goes to charities, social enterprise, government, NGOs. The Endelman Group just did a big study in that recently. So trust is at the heart of this. And yes, we need a shared value model. Um, so we're bringing business benefits and social impact benefits together so that every, everybody benefits in that. Um, and I think that goes beyond data itself. It also goes through the processes. For example, if we look at Agritech, from the farmer right to your plate, we need everybody rewarded in that process. So also when we're talking about blockchain and AI, we should be going beyond that as well. There are many emergent technologies that we can integrate from RFID tagging to drones to UAVs. All of these are coming together. So we need to look at it slightly more than just a blockchain and AI marriage perspective as well. I think we need to go more broader than that. But absolutely, yes, I think going forward, the shared value model for business is where we should be going. We need to put the trust back. And Joseph, do you think that edge computing can be a solution? Edge computing is a... Edge computing is a way to not having to centralize the data. So edge computing as a way, so for machine learning, you have training and you have inference. So training is when your model learns from data and inference is when it makes predictions. So first of all, yeah, uh, inference on the edge is the first step of decentralization. So basically you want to run the engine that makes predictions as close to the user as possible so that you don't need to centralize the data. And that's actually just a, an engineering problem in a way because the thing has already been trained, you just need to be able to find locally the resources to run your model. And in most cases, that's, uh, that's possible. We actually run a speech recognition engine that's as good as Google's on the Raspberry Pi 3, so that's possible. For training, as I said, federated learning is something that's gonna be learning locally and then you aggregate uh, the learnings of everything. Doing that on the edge, so that local thing, local training on the edge, that's something, something that no one is looking at. So we're talking to semiconductor uh, producers. They're doing neural chips, but all of these are meant for inference. Training on the edge is something that's quite beyond what people are thinking of today, but that's probably something that we should start looking at. Since we have like the last, uh, the, the last round. Um, so do you see a question for all the panelists. Do you see a more energy efficient, first of all, blockchain 2.0 emerging? I'll, I'll start from, from Vince. So in terms of energy efficiency, I mean, like looking at AI again, as I said, this is why it all boils down to efficiency. And this is where there is lack of efficiency, maybe, or where improvements can be done. That is where AI can fit, because it's purposely created for that, to identify ways how we can improve certain process. So definitely I can see, this is why I mentioned before even like uh, the like the proof of work type of algorithms. These are situations where I believe there is a lot of, lot of space for AI where I can help. Something else since this is the last round, what I wish to mention is with regard to smart contracts, which I believe uh, sort of this is really important. Um, we're seeing sort of in the AI space on its own, we're seeing that obviously AI is being applied to a lot of situations, being it in finance, being it in medical, but basically we're saying that they're being applied in very important decisions with extremely kind of possibly even life-threatening kind of situations. So I think in the panel, one of the panels that we've seen, we had before, they mentioned the idea of the legal aspect, which is supported by smart contracts, and I wish to extend that, that underneath that, the third layer, I see AI. Why? Because AI, I see it as the layer underneath, and they need, or sort of the ideal way, in my opinion, is that they need a front end managed by smart contracts. Because there needs to be a layer that if I'm accessing a web service, sorry, if I'm accessing a, a, an AI algorithm through a web service, I need certain commitment in terms of the, the performance that that mm -hmm. algorithm is giving me. Um, so, so these obligations, I think, need to as well be sort of, you know, cover 
the AI algorithms as well. So I think smart contracts fit a lot Thanks. in this space. Thank you, Vince, Sally. Okay, we've got 38 seconds, so very quickly, yeah, we'll be, yeah. yes, we can't have a juxtaposition with environmental impact and mining cost, but certainly the partners we're working with, the developments in that space are rapidly escalating. So yes, absolutely, it's the next level. Excellent, and yeah, Joe? You love this? Yeah, efficiency is important, and especially if you're gonna have a system that relies on the blockchain, you wanna make sure that you're not sharing resources mm -hmm. with other people that are gonna take it from you when you did it. So application specific blockchains are today potentially a solution. There's definitely a reason why Bitcoin's inefficiency actually makes a perfect sense for the um, transaction sizes. We are looking at AI, we need far more efficient systems, but for all of you, I think the key is focus on the customers, focus on adding real value to the environment, and then value comes to you as well and for all of us for the ecosystem. And I think there's huge value in blockchain, huge value in AI. Let's bring them together together. Excellent, thank, thank you. you very much. I hope that you'll find the AI interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Ah. Oh.